right place and the right way to to be harsh with ourselves. Ah, uh, okay. Mm. My instinct is no. <laughs> um, I think it relates a little bit to the last of those five that the Buddha talked about. I guess that would be kind of like crushing mind with mind, like being harsh with yourself in the hope that you would stop thinking a certain way or behaving a certain way. And I think it is a last resort because it's just a very... Um, it's coming from willpower rather than wisdom and understanding sometimes. I think that you know if we can understand um, why we behave the way we do and contact the suffering in that, then there's an opportunity to develop compassion. And I think compassion is much more effective than speaking in a harsh way. You know, when we actually... But it does involve contacting that suffering, first of all. Because we do suffer, you know, through our misinformed conduct or, you know, ways we relate, ways we behave that aren't very skillful. We're the first people who suffer from that, actually. And it's the same for others, you know. I think that really helps me not to judge others when I realise... Yeah, for somebody to behave that way, there must be a lot of struggle in a struggle. And I think when we can recognise that, we can learn to speak to ourselves in a different way. Like, yeah, sure, maybe you could say, I shouldn't have done that, or don't do that again, such as, you know, you can say that to yourself. But maybe first you need to meet it and just find the words, you know, around it. So, you know, yeah, I know that this hurts. Like, how can I care for that feeling? How can I care for this? And from there, sometimes things dissolve on their own, you know, the, the behavior starts to change. I think once you realize that it harms you, it starts to change. And it doesn't use the word should. The teachings never really use the word should. So it's more that... Um, to me, the part that stuck out was the part about investigating and using scrutiny. So I would say that it's more a process of developing wisdom than ra rather than a kind of, oh dear, I'm not meant to do that, I'm meant to do it this way, not that way. It's more like, this is a process of learning. Like, maybe I can observe this situation really carefully. You know? And if there's anything that makes you feel like there is grounds for suspicion, take that seriously and observe it. Like, say, with my teacher, right? I had complete confidence in him from, like, the second talk, third talk. I mean, actually, the first talk, but two or three talks, and I was ready to kind of leave my um, monastery in Burma and find my teacher. That was the strength of my faith. But still, after coming in contact with him, and even today, I always watch him. I watch what he does, how he behaves, how he relates to others. Not because there's any doubt, but just because I want to learn. But at times, yeah... You know, there are things where I think, I don't really understand what's happening here. Let me sort of ask or let me investigate or, you know, maybe talk to another monk about it. And, you know, like, why does he eat such bad food? <laughs> 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 Whatever it is, you know. Because I think it's really important to assuage one's doubts. Like, we, we are rational beings and, and we need to know for ourselves why things are the way they are, why, you know, why we need to be suspicious or not to be suspicious. I think... It's good to keep that investigative spirit. Um, yeah. I don't know if that really answers the question, because you might have had a particular situation um, in mind that I'm... That's I'm sure. more I, I guess, I guess um, your answer sounds a bit yeah. different to the idea. Like, I suppose I don't understand when you should... What matters you should just have trust in. Oh, uh, OK. Uh, right, I see what you mean, yeah. So, like... Um, the bit well, about not to be suspicious of matters which um, are deserving of confidence. Yeah? Yeah. I think that is maybe the difference between, like, a sceptical doubt and a kind of investigative doubt, again. Because sometimes we can be so cynical about something, you know, that we don't even allow ourselves the opportunity to develop faith. And when doubt becomes something that, like, actually 
um, turns us away from investigating. Like a lot of people say, oh, you know, karma and rebirth, that can't be part of the teachings, that must be wrong. And I mean, that's fine if you come to that conclusion, but maybe it's more healthy to just keep an open mind and keep watching, keep looking. Because, you know, there's this concept of beginner's mind as well in, in practice. And I think there's a difference between being so cynical that you can't even... That basically your mind's closed to something. And being um, not, not decided, being undecided, but continuing to kind of investigate for yourself. And I think that's important, even if you have faith. I guess that's why I gave the example of my teacher, because I have faith. But it doesn't mean I don't investigate, I don't watch, I don't attend carefully. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great. Do you think we, um, as a culture, do you think that we um, express our appreciation and gratitude enough? I'm just wondering, like, in, in your own practices of speech, whether there's something you can see you could, like, kind of beautify, I guess, make more beautiful, or some potential of speech to bring about harmony or happiness that we're not really fully using yet. I think our tool is speaking to us head and it depends on, on, on what environment you're in as well. Because there is, I have the sense that there is a speech where being skeptical yeah. and being the critical mind you were referring to also really the sort of Translates itself into being very hesitant to use any form of speech to be as mad as being, I don't know, too sweet and too uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, emotional. Yeah. There's a sort of negative connotation attached to uh, yeah. emotion. Right. And then the other is being, being very fusive but with mm. very little substance. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. And, 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 so there's a sort of, and anything in between. But there are, I can see that, for example, in, 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 I'm thinking of either academic circles or other professional circles, uh, being, there is a level of skepticism. Yeah, skepticism. Even cynicism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And being to a certain time. Yeah. And, and also a lot of, particularly in, in this country, a lot of battles being to preserve. A lot of what, sorry? To reserve, being reserved. Being very reserved, yeah. As if not expressing it. Yes. So there's a sort of mixed up between emotions and, yeah. and speech that right. is sort of around there. So. Yeah, some kind of disjunct or, yeah, dissonance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's really an interesting point. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes I think your speech is like sort of a kind of nourishment that we can give each other. And sometimes I, I just look at people and I feel like we're so undernourished in those ways. <laughs> you know, virtually receiving compliments or praise or just a bit of accreditation where, you, where it's deserved. And often, I don't know about you, but I remember like a couple of years ago on a Mains retreat, I... Um, I just felt really happy and sort of appreciative of my companion in that retreat, and I, I tried to tell her. And uh, she just kept refusing to hear me and saying, no, 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 no. And because I was very sensitive, it actually felt like there was an energy coming out from me to her, which was very spontaneous and beautiful, and it was meeting a wall, and it was actually quite harsh. It was like coming back at me quite harsh. And I just felt like, ouch. <laughs> and I, I kept trying, and I could feel this kind of really strange energetic resistance. And finally she sort of said, okay, I accept that. Because I said, can you just say that? Like, I accept that. Like, yes. Because my teacher says that. You know, he says, thank you when somebody gives you a, 
some praise because the person wants to give, right? We always think it's about me, you know, how do I receive it? But the person wants and needs to give. And when she did that, there was like a complete relief in my body. Like my whole body just relaxed. And I was like, thank you for accepting that, you know, because I needed to give it. <laughs> and uh, there is a resistance and it's a kind of, it is ego actually, it is a sense of self. You know, because we often, I think there's a fear in, in this culture anyway, I don't know about others, that if we hear positive things about ourselves, we'll get a big head. But actually, you just get a big heart. You just get softer. <laughs> but it's hard because it goes against the grain. But, you know, we've got these self images and we sort of, yeah, or maybe I'm the one that has to keep things together and not show emotion or whatever it is, you know. And sometimes it's so hard to go against the grain. But I think whenever you do find that resistance, it's good to go against it. Yeah. But yeah, I can see that that might be tricky in a professional situation. Uh, yeah. Actually, in my old monastery, I mean, people did used to express themselves, but mostly only in writing and mostly in, like, birthday cards. So every birthday we'd get these cards and they'd have everybody's message and it was so lovely. It was like a real celebration of that person. But I used to think, oh, do I have to wait the whole year for that, you know? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it doesn't necessarily manifest as being put in like, active resistance to uh-huh. those compliments. I sometimes find, uh, as a teacher, if you're giving students the combination of positive feedback and then slipping in more yeah. informative comments. Yeah. It's a bit like in the mindfulness course, they talk about the Teflon mind to yeah. be positive uh-huh. that just doesn't yep. take any of that in. It's not necessarily a yep. wall, it's like they don't take the time to like absorb it and they dis- disproportionately attach on to the negative and that's all they hear. Absolutely. That's all they hear and they either get defensive or they get upset and they speak, you know, yeah. um, and then if you call them, they're too negative. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I read statistics on that. It was something like two seconds for a negative comment and about 30 seconds for positive feedback to go in. Which is interesting. About three o'clock in the morning is the one negative thing that's going out of ten positive comments. Yep. So it shows how the mind is primed that way. Absolutely. And I'm just thinking, you know, Chris Cullen has talked about making the practice out. He talks about, like, saturating in the positive and kind of really taking the time yeah. to open to it as Actually, especially because it feels uncomfortable. Yeah. I think that's what we need to work on, which is, I guess, why I like to focus on this positive aspect, because I think we just don't. You know, I mean, when people talk about precepts, I bet if anybody here would tell me, you can't do this, 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 it's not, oh, you must speak compassion, you know, speaking words of bringing people together. We don't think like that, and it is, it is a cultural thing. You know, we've been educated that way because that's the way that we're going to survive and improve and do well at school or in university is to constantly improve on yourself and look for your weaknesses and make them into strengths or just look for your weaknesses <laughs> against someone else <laughs> in competition you know? so yeah it's tricky um, after years of being around my teacher I mean it, I feel the love, but it doesn't always go in. I mean, it, it, it's like each time I'm around him, especially when we're in England and, you know, I'm travelling around, it's like it goes in a bit deep, and I think, gosh, it's taken this long. And, and goodness knows how deeply it can go in, but it's because maybe I deep down aren't able to fully, fully accept love. You know? There's still a part of me that thinks, is it really unconditional? <laughs> mm-hmm. it's, yeah, it's tricky. Yeah, I guess they're sort of primed also to hear those negative things. It's not that you may be saying too many of them, it's just that they're on the lookout for it. So it's kind of partly their work as well. Yeah, that's kind of all they're interested in. Yeah, it's tricky. But I don't think we can say too many positive things. If it's honest, I mean, you can't just kind of, you have to know where you're coming from and be real about it. <laughs> mm. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. Totally, I understand that because it's sort of becoming like it can turn into a, a sort of um, you internalize it as like oh now I need to continue to do that. It's like something else you've got to live up to. <laughs> but actually, I wonder if it could be more about um, if there's more potential there not to take it necessarily as like meaning something about you, but just an opportunity to see that somebody is happy and they're expressing their happiness and their appreciation, and just develop moody to, to about that you know that could be another way to kind of uplift the mind through that without making it about you just okay this person's come to me appreciating something that means that they feel they're feeling good they're feeling happy and maybe I could just reflect on that and, and how lovely that is because that will encourage you to do these things more but not with a direct reference to you if you see what I mean just it could encourage the understanding of cause and effect as well and just the practice of learning to take joy in other people's happiness. Because I think when people are um, positive or appreciative, it is about them, actually. It's a beautiful quality in them that they're able to feel that gratitude. So I don't know. That could be one way to uh, to open up to that, perhaps. Now you can remember it and bring up the happiness. Oh, that's great. That's so. Oh. I think they were a bit perplexed. <laughs> probably, but they'll remember that for sure. Because that's probably never happened before, I guess. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> nice. Good. So, uh, shall we just sit for? Two, three minutes to end the session before we go. And just uh, invite you to appreciate this silent space before you go back into your busy lives or quiet lives, maybe. <laughs>